Let's sing the doxology together. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Please be seated. My name is Andrew, and I'm one of the elders here at Truth Point. And uh, as I was preparing to lead us in, in prayer this morning, I was thinking on that hymn that we actually just sang. And I, I looked up uh, who wrote it, and it was an Anglican bishop named Reginald Herber. Not enough Reginalds these days. We need more Reginalds. But one comment that almost all the historians made note of is how the song doesn't just initiate praise, but but rather it encourages us to just join in the endless song from the saints throughout time, rising early in the morning to sing of the Lord's mercy and might, to the angels now falling before him, to the earth and the sky and the sea, praising him and fulfilling their natural duty. And it's just a good reminder that we don't need to invent something new. Uh, we don't need to try to muster up the latest trend in order to worship our God rightly, but instead just to join in the song that God has put in motion with the saints before us and the angels above us and nature beside us. 
So let's do that now, not only in song, but in prayer. So please bow your heads as we join in and worship our Lord through prayer. O Lord, blessed be your name from now and forevermore. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is rightly to be praised. You are high above all nations and your glory above the heavens. Who is like you dwelling on high and yet you come to earth to meet us? You raise the humble from the dust, lift the poor from their filth to make us sit with you as princes. You make the barren fruitful and those that the world would despise into beloved in your sight. We acknowledge this morning that we all, being conceived and born in sin, are inclined to evil and slow to good. We transgress your holy commandments and corrupt ourselves more and more. Father, for this, we are sorry. We ask for your grace and your help. Please have mercy upon us and increase in us the Holy Spirit, that we may recognize our sin, feel true conviction of it, and then die to them completely. And please... Um, renew us in the newness of life that you have granted to us. And in asking for this, we remember now specifically the, silent, uh, the, the sins we will now silently confess. Lord, we thank you for the words found in Isaiah 53. We thank you for your son, Jesus, who has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, who was pierced for our transgressions and crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. Thank you, Father, for sending your son. Thank you, Jesus, for bearing our sins. And thank you, Holy Spirit, for giving us new hearts to see and believe this wonderful truth. Father, please bless the tithes and offerings that will be received this day and this week. Please incline our hearts to imitate you in being generous as you have been generous to us, and to do so with a heart smiling as we stockpile treasures in heaven that we no doubt will receive one day. And as we remember the dignity you gave life when coming as a babe and all of our humble beginnings in utero, we lift up all the fellow boys and girls that are still in danger due to the unwillingness to exalt the preciousness of life. We thank you for the overturning of Roe versus Wade last year saving countless lives, but we understand there's still much work to be done. Let that work first start with a richer theology of human life, with an understanding that all life, whether planned or unplanned, whether born into rich or poor circumstances, whether born with full capacities or with mental and or physical challenges, is worthy of dignity, honor, and preservation because they are born in your image. And because we so value you, God, we value anything made in your likeness. Please bless uh, uh, First Care Women's Clinic as they seek to live this out and have been a blessing to many, many women and families that have turned to them for help. Please bless their finances and, and use us to further their efforts in both time and treasure. And Lord, we realize that Truth Point is not our church, but your church. You reign over all people, all of your people as the gracious king you are. And so we desire that all churches that preach your gospel will flourish. We pray specifically this morning for Lake Osborne Presbyterian Church and their pastor, Adam Masterson. Thank you for your continued faithfulness to that church, and please use them to help the lost follow you and to build up your saints further into the good news in which you have called them. We also pray this morning for Cameron and Chelsea Smith serving with Youth for Christ. We thank you for the warm and welcoming staff that has greeted them at Royal Palm High and we ask for increased student and staff involvement there. Similarly, please give them a clear path to be a tool you use to save and grow the students of Wellington High as they serve there as well. And lastly, Father, we pray this morning with our heads bowed because we come in submission to you. We pray recognizing that apart from you, we have nothing and can do nothing. We recognize that everything comes from you both spiritually and physically. And this being the case, we say now the words that your son taught us to say. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power 
and the glory forever. Amen. Well, just a reminder, next Sunday is Memory Verse Sunday, so don't let it sneak up on you. But this week, our responsive reading comes from Isaiah 55. I'll begin by uh, reading the first passage there. You'll find it in your bulletin. You can just follow along by reading the bold passages. Behold, you shall call a nation that you do not know, and a nation that did not know you shall run to you, because of the Lord your God and of the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there, but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. Oof, amen. Well, please stand as you're able and we uh, continue worshiping. Out here and 
Father, you're holy. it up. Serpent that hurts and is 
destroys will be killed and all that is broken Amen. Before you have a seat, please turn and greet your neighbor with the peace of Christ. Please be aware we do not have gospel kids for elementary, so everyone can stay in here, start our sermon in about a minute. All right, if you could make your way to your seat, that'd be great. Don't want anyone to be afraid. We have rescheduled the baptisms for this morning. We haven't forgotten them. Uh, they'll be rescheduled in the next couple weeks. If you have your Bible, please open it to Colossians chapter 1. Last week, you may remember, we began our study in this book, and we looked at the first two verses in it, which is a greeting from Paul to the church at Colossae. Today we move on to a section that spans from verse 3 through verse 23 in which Paul thanks God for the Colossians and uh, thanks God for the Colossians and for God's work in them. We'll likely spend three weeks in this section of thanksgiving as its uh, paragraphs have different emphases. Thanksgiving, immediately following the introductory greeting, is common for the Apostle Paul's letters, though it is not his exclusive practice. In Galatians, for example, he goes immediately into a rebuke, which marks the occasion of that book's writing. But here in Colossians, he offers thanksgiving extendedly. Thanksgiving is uh, not only a holiday, but it's also an element of prayer and a necessary one, perhaps the most neglected one. You may have heard of that acronym, ACTS, A-C-T-S, as describing the four great themes of prayer found in the Word and therefore reflected in the worship of God on the Lord's Day, A-C-T-S, adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and supplication. God speaks to us by His Word, and we respond to Him in prayer in these ways. We adore God for who He is and what He has done. And we confess our sins to Him as we recognize how far short we fall of His holy standard. And then we thank Him, not only for forgiving us, but also for everything that He has provided for us, for every good gift comes from the Father above. And then finally, we bring our requests to Him. That is what supplication means, adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and supplication. It probably doesn't take much convincing that the one thing we tend not to think of or maybe move on from shortly after thinking of it, both in worship and individually throughout the week, is thanksgiving. It is uh, common to our hearts to take His, his gifts his protection, his fatherly care for granted. But God calls us to thank him. It is, it is for our good. Paul here spends a great deal of his opening chapter doing that very thing. So, if you are able, I would invite you to stand as we read the first eight verses 
of Colossians, focusing mainly on verses 3 through 8. Colossians 1, 1 through 8, reading from the English Standard Version. Brothers and sisters, this is God's holy word. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. Of this you have heard before in the word of the truth, the gospel, which has come to you as indeed the whole wor- in the whole world it is bearing fruit and increasing, as it also does so among you since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God in truth, just as, you, just as you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant. He is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf, and he has made known to us your love in the Spirit. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Would you pray with me, please? Oh God, during these few moments we have together, we pray that you would work powerfully to, uh, in us, Lord, through your spirit, by your word. Oh Lord, we pray that you would show us that you are worthy to be praised and to be thanked, for you have given us so much. So Lord, would you make much of Christ and his gospel in us even now? We pray this in his name. Amen. Please have a seat. There is a uh, term that has fallen out of usage in the past couple of decades, and that term is pen pal. I wonder how many of you teenagers would know what that meant without, you know, thinking it through and figuring it out. Do you know what a pen pal is? When I was a kid, everyone knew what a pen pal was, and so did our parents and probably our grandparents, right? A pen pal was someone you had a relationship with that was essentially done in the exchange of written letters, presumably, though not necessarily, written with a pen. I suppose a pencil would suffice. We weren't uh, legalistic about that part, at least not in the Presbyterian world. But, uh, that was a joke, but uh, because of electronic communication, you know, email and texting, uh, being so much easier today, few people bother to write letters. We prefer uh, quicker Uh, faster, shorter, more frequent communication. An interesting facet of uh, the practice of having a pen pal was that sometimes you would have never met your pen pal. Perhaps you learned of the existence of that person through a mutual friend or by some other means. You were introduced to that person through the mail, and the entirety of that relationship was conducted via mail. I actually have someone today who I consider a good friend who's a pastor in Vancouver, Canada, and we've uh, interacted hundreds of times through text and email, and yet we have never met, and in fact, we have never spoken on the phone. Well, what is interesting throughout the letter of Colossians, and quite significant as we consider our passage together this morning, is that the Apostle Paul had never met the Colossians prior to writing it. There was a man named Epaphras, who we meet here in verse 7, who heard the gospel preached by Paul, almost certainly during his three years ministering in the city, the nearby city of Ephesus. He heard the gospel, he believed in Christ as his Savior, and he went on to become a, a, a disciple and a companion of Paul in his imprisonment. But before doing that, Epaphras brought the message of Christ to his hometown of Colossae, and through his faithful ministry a church was born. Now, the reason this is significant in our passage today is that Paul dedicates his thanksgiving to God for the Colossians based on report only. He never met them. And so, the the form of his thanksgiving is... uh, is not overly specific or unique. There's a, uh, there's a generality and a universality, a, a catholicity, we could say, of what he gives thanks to God for on their behalf. And one reason this is helpful for us is because what is true about the Colossians and their faith is, generally speaking, true about all people who have been saved 
from their sins by the grace of God found in Jesus Christ. So what we have here, we could say, is somewhat of a, of a blueprint of what we can thank God for regarding our salvation. Thanksgiving uh, to God is a fruit of the gospel, and it's also one that needs to be cultivated and practiced by those who are recipients of his grace. As I said, it is for our good from our God. Thanksgiving is not merely to be done as an act or kind of like a one-time uh, box check, but as a way, a pattern, a condition of the heart. In Philippians 4, 6, and 7, Paul writes, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be, be, be made known to God and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So in this passage of God's of uh, Paul's thankfulness to God for the Colossian church, and as we consider the fruit of uh, thankfulness together, we're going to look at the way that God uses the gospel to work thanksgiving into our hard hearts. And we're going to see it uh, in two parts. And this is our outline. It's printed for you in your worship guide if you'd like to take notes. We're going to see what the gospel produces in our hearts and then how the gospel penetrates our hearts. And as we look at this together, we want to be asking ourselves if we are thankful people and if we recognize the value of the grace of Christ that is ours. So first, what the gospel produces in our hearts. We're looking at the first half of that paragraph beginning at verse 3. As we said, Paul is merely writing off of a report about the Colossians, likely from Epaphras. And what does he thank God for in his prayers for them? He is giving thanks, as we see in verse 6, for the fruit that the gospel produced in them and is growing in them. And there are three fruit he mentions which comprise a, um, we, could, we could say, a triad of, of spiritual Christian virtues for the Apostle Paul, one that he uses many times in his writings, faith, love, and hope. Let's look at those verses again, starting at verse 3. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. Faith, love, and hope. He uses these three often. It's uh, similar to his greeting to the Thessalonians, in which he writes in 1 Thessalonians 1, 3, remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfast hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. It's what he gives thanks to the Lord for in the hearts of the Ephesians. In Ephesians chapter 1, we read, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. And of course, perhaps the most famous usage of this triad is found at the end of Paul's great chapter on love in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. The final verse is, so now faith, hope, and love abide, these three, but the greatest of these is love. These three virtues are what we could say uh, graces given to the people of God that in some way encapsulate all of the faith that was given to us by God, all of true religion. It is what God grants and cultivates in the hearts of all Christians and for which all Christians are meant to give him thanks. But, but what are they? What do they mean? Let's, let's look at them very briefly, one by one, because though they're, they're such common words to us, perhaps they're so common that we, we don't take a minute to stop and think what is God saying here. So first, we see faith. Paul thanks God for the faith of the Colossians. Paul says, we always thank God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ when we pray for you since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus. What does it mean? Well, it's the Greek word pistis. It's a noun. It's closely related to the verb pistuo, which we read in our English Bibles translated as to believe. I don't typically like quoting Greek words, but I say those Greek words because you see the connection. Faith is pistis. To believe is pistuo. All right? It's the same word, same root. So to understand what faith is, we need to understand that it's believing something, right? 
But it's not simply believing in something, or it's not simply an intellectual acknowledgement that something exists, like, you know, I, I believe the sky is blue, or I believe water is wet, or I believe putting cold white cream into beautiful black hot coffee makes no sense whatsoever, which I do believe, by the way. I believe that wholeheartedly. But, but faith is not simply acknowledging something is true that is insufficient. As James says, even the demons believe, even the demons pistuo in God, and they shudder. But faith is rather to believe with your will. It is to trust with confidence in the Lord Jesus Christ and His great work for you on the cross. In fact, uh, our confessional standards, the West Westminster Shorter Catechism, beautifully defines faith in question and answer 86. This is it. Question, what is faith in Jesus Christ? Answer, faith in Jesus Christ is a saving grace whereby we receive and rest upon Him alone for salvation as He is offered to us in the gospel. That is faith. We receive and rest in Jesus Christ alone for our salvation, not in our goodness, not in our works, not in our humility, not in our generosity, not in our intellect, not in anything in us. No, we receive and rest in Jesus Christ alone. So, Paul gives thanks to the faith that the Colossians have in Jesus Christ. Secondly, he gives thanks for their love. What does Paul mean when he thanks God for the love they have for all the saints in verse 4? Well, we know as a uh, John tells us that God is love. We know that we love because he first loved us. As it says in 1 John 4.10, in this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he has loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. But what is it? Is it an emotion? Is it a feeling? Is it a disposition? We speak of love all the time as something we can fall in and out of. We say we love animals and sports teams and people and God. What is love? It seems that since love is something that originates with God, who is love, and is produced in us from God in order to grasp what loving our brother and sister means, we need to grasp what his love for us is. In chapter 12 of his great book, Knowing God, J.I. Packer defines God's love as an exercise of his goodness toward individual sinners, whereby having identified himself with their welfare, he has given his son to be their savior and now brings them to know and enjoy him in a covenant relation. I'm going to read that again. This is God's love. God's love is an exercise of his goodness toward individual sinners, whereby having identified himself with their welfare, he has given his son to be their savior and now brings them to know and enjoy him in a covenant relationship. Relationship, forgive me. Our love reflects his love. It flows out of it. So what Paul gives thanks for in the Colossians and what we are to have and to give thanks to God for is reflected in that kind of love towards all the saints. That is, towards all of God's people. We want Christ and his goodness and his blessing found ultimately in his work for sinners in the gospel to be received and rested by others. We want to love others with our words and our thoughts and our actions by pointing them to Jesus Christ, by acting in his name, and, for re and by resting in his work for them on the cross. There is a cross shape to all actual love. We realize that, that we cannot ultimately meet the needs of other people, the other saints uh, that Paul is referring to here, but Christ can and Christ did, and so we act out of his goodness and point them to him. There's obviously so much more we could say about this, but perhaps for now it would suffice to ask God to give us ever-increasing attitudes of love towards other people, a love that is convinced that what they need more than anything is to believe and rest in Jesus Christ for his salvation. Third, and finally, we see Paul giving thanks in verse 5 for the hope laid up for you in heaven. The way it's worded here actually places hope as being the source, the objective cause of his thanksgiving. It is because of the hope laid up for you in heaven that he gives thanks. As we have seen together here at Truth Point, 
in our study of Ruth and in our Advent series. Hope is not simply a wish for something that may or may not come true. That's not what the Bible means when it says hope. Hope is a present grace of a future certainty. Our hope, as Paul says here, is in heaven where the Lord Jesus is. And one day we will realize the blessings of being with him and will receive the fullness of our salvation as we are with him in glory. Later in chapter 1, Paul will write that it is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So hope looks forward to its reward. And we are to look forward to our reward. This is essential to the Christian faith, knowing that heaven is not to be found on earth so long as our Savior is in heaven. It will one day come down here in glory when the new Jerusalem descends with the Lord Jesus, and he will reign forever and ever, and we will be with him. But we hope for that. We don't have that. We look forward to our inheritance, right? And so when you're frustrated that things are not the way they ought to be in this world or in your life, God, in his fatherly care for you, is wanting you to give him thanks for the grace of hope that one day he will fulfill every promise in Christ. This is built upon the reality, the reality that things are not going to be as they ought to be in this life until he returns, and he will return in glory. That is hope is for our comfort. So, what the gospel produces in our hearts is thankfulness for faith, love, and hope. Secondly, we want to see how the gospel penetrates our hearts, how it works. How does this a grace get in, if you will? It's interesting, the writing of Colossians was no more than three decades after the Lord Jesus was nailed to a Roman cross and lifted off the earth. And time Uh, You know, time flies by now, right? Um, We exchange information rapidly now. Not so then. Things moved slowly. And it was no more than three decades since Jesus Christ was nailed to a cross and crucified. It was no more than three decades after his disciples fled, not knowing what to do as their teacher was dead and, and buried was no more than three decades after that same Lord and God, as, as Thomas confessed, defeated death and resurrected and appeared to those same disciples, teaching them until he ascended to heaven to reign over all things. And in that short period of time, Paul can write that that message, the gospel, had gone out and, verse 6, in the whole world it is bearing fruit and growing. It's remarkable. Um, even historians who deny the supernatural altogether, right, who, who are strict materialists, have to admit and do admit that the rise and spread of Christianity in the Roman Empire in the first and second centuries is one of the most remarkable sociological developments in all of human history. The apostles had no power, they had no money, they had no formal education, especially none recognized by the high Greek culture of the day, and yet people by the thousands and thousands confessed Jesus is Lord under pain of death and were baptized into his church. And they gathered the first day of the week in celebration of word and sacrament. And those people came from every sphere of life. Uh, There's a a very famous quote from the church father Tertullian when he was writing uh, his, his pagan neighbors, his pagan friends, that is those who believe in the Roman pantheon of gods in the early third century. So early, uh, uh, was it 200s, right? Early 200s. This is what he said. We are but of yesterday, and yet we already fill your cities, islands, camps, your palace, senate, and forum. We have left you only your temples. We are but of yesterday, and yet we already fill your cities, islands, camps, your palace, senate, and forum. We have left you only your temples. Your temples you keep. God's people in Christ will be everywhere else and from everywhere else. The Christians were seemingly everywhere, and they came from everywhere. But how? What, what is the an- How did this happen? This this remarkable sociological development. How did it happen? 
How did they follow a crucified, poor son of a carpenter whom they had never met? How? Very simply, they heard of him. He was preached to them, and their hearts were changed for eternity. That's how God works. He did then, he does now. We see here what what we see throughout Holy Scripture, that God's word is proclaimed and heard, and that is the weapon that the eternal Holy Spirit of God wields to change hearts, and he does so forever. He changes us forever. As Paul writes in Ephesians 6, 7, the sword of the Spirit is the word of God. It is his weapon. And in Romans 10, 17, faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. And we see that, that reality of, of people's hearts being changed by hearing the message of the gospel referred to uh, no less than three times here, twice explicitly and then once implicitly. Look at verse 5. Of this you have heard before in the word of truth the gospel. Verse 6. Since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God in truth. And then verse 7. Just as you learned it from Epaphras, our fellow our beloved fellow servant. This is the way God works. As Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 1, 22 and 23, Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. Isn't it an amazing thing? I just read this. A friend of mine wrote this this week, and I can't stop thinking of it. Isn't it amazing that the most um, spectacular visually stunning moment in Jesus's earthly ministry, that is his transfiguration upon the mountain. You know that story? He is, he is transfigured. He is seen by Peter, James, and John shining like the sun, it says. The voice from heaven came, and the voice did not say, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Look at him. Not what he said. You would think that that would be what, it it was visually spectacular. He was shining like the sun. This this rabbi of theirs was shining like the sun and talking with, with Elijah and Moses. But what did the father say? This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. Faith does not come by sight. It comes by hearing. And we walk by faith and not by sight. And as we saw briefly last week, the so-called Colossian heresy that led to the writing of this letter was a blending of the true faith with the surrounding culture of their day, probably both Jewish and and Gentile. We'll see this uh, in depth, God willing, uh, when we come to chapter 2, that that it resulted in the addition of certain works or practices that focused on self-denial as a means to ascertain the fullness of of God. And Paul writes again and again, no, you have Christ. Hear his word. Trust in who he is. Don't add things to him. As we saw last week, it's always a temptation, perhaps the temptation of the church in every age to blend the beliefs, the patterns, the posture, the tone of the surrounding culture with its own in an effort to be seen as more tolerable, more winsome, or even less threatening to the world. And I'm sure you can think of examples of this in your own life, in your workplace, in your neighborhood, or kids in your schools, with your friends, when blending what you know to be true about God and His Word with something a little less offensive would make your life just a little bit easier. It's what your brothers and sisters have always struggled with. It's what kids, what your parents struggle with. It is a common temptation to us to blend the truth of God's Word with the wisdom of the world. It's a bit of an aside, but we can see this this desire to blend in or to adopt the spirit of the age, even in the way that modern people look at worship on Sunday mornings. I don't know who originally said it, but... uh, Theologian and historian Carl Truman quotes it all the time that centuries ago, Christians would go to church on Sunday in order to have their misery explained to them. Is that why you're here this morning, to have your misery explained to you? You see, in previous centuries, sin and death and temptation and poverty were 
everywhere. Most churches had, had burial sites on their property. They walked through on the, way to the, on the way to worship the graves of their fathers and their grandfathers. They had less distractions. They had less medicines in the world. The, the mortality rate was so much higher than it is today. And so when they went to worship God, they were expecting the framework or the liturgy and the preaching of the Word to give them a framework of the gospel to be the grid for their suffering. They were expecting an order that, that highlighted their great need and Christ's great provision in the gospel and the, and the surety of His return and the temporariness of this life. And they were looking forward to, to hearing again of the consummation of history when Christ would return and when their hope would be realized. But now, you know, and I'm not pointing at anyone individually, I point to myself. What do most modern Christians tend to want? Well, ours is a consumer culture, right? It's entertainment. It's full of distractions. So we want to be thrilled. We want to be entertained. We want an emotional high or a lighthearted pep talk. We certainly don't want to hear of misery, death but it's everywhere. It's everywhere. This temptation to blend even how we worship God with the culture around us. Paramount temptation. But according to the plan of God, the will of God, the goodness of God, the gospel penetrates our hearts through the hearing of the word by the spirit of God. Simple and reverent and beautiful is the response in worship for the powers in the word and not in our packaging of it. And in the simple and clear proclamation of it, God, by his grace, uses his spirit to penetrate our hearts with the gospel. And since then, it has been bearing fruit and growing the world around. My friend, are you a thankful person? Do you actively thank God for giving you everything you have? Do you value the faith, love, and hope given you in Jesus Christ above all other things? Do you thank God for the work that he has done in you? Do you thank him for those graces? Well, it's a convicting question. But we must say that praise God, praise God, that the surety of your salvation and mine does not depend on how thankful you are, but rather on how faithful Jesus Christ was. Though we are to give thanks, we are not saved by our thanks any more than we are saved by our faith. No, we are saved, you are saved by Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God, salvation is of Him and not of us. And a right understanding of this, my friends, that He saved us by His own grace is the true fuel for being thankful to Him. I'm going to uh, close with a quote from the great Charles Spurgeon that highlights this. Do not trust your repentance. Do not trust your faith. Do not rely upon your feelings. Do not depend upon your knowledge. Above all, do not depend upon your sense of need. Do not come to Christ as a sensible sinner. Do not come trusting Christ feeling that you are a man who has a right to come, that you answer to a certain character that may come, but come because you are a sinner, because you have nothing to recommend you, because if, God's, because if God should search you through and through, he could not find a point in you, a spot in you large enough to put the point of a pin upon that was good. Come because you are vile, Come to be pardoned. The word of the Lord was not when I see your faith, but when I see the blood, I will pass over you. O oh soul, if you trust Christ, the blood is on your brow today before the eyes of God. No condemnation. Why then need you fear? You are safe, for the blood secures every soul that once is sheltered thereby. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you shall be saved. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ for you today. Thanks be to God. Let's pray together. Our Lord, we do pray that you would help us to be thankful to you. We pray, Lord, that you would increase in us a, 
a desire to give you praise and thanks for your many gifts. Yes, even the gift of prayer, knowing that you hear us because of Christ. And more than anything, Lord, would you work in us thankful hearts for Jesus Christ, he who was given for us. And now as we come to this table, Lord, this table which has ordinary things, simple elements upon it, we pray that you, by your Spirit, would use the Word to shape our hearts to believe you more. Lord, we pray that you would, by your Word, using the sacrament, Lord, show us that Christ really came and died for us and that his death was sufficient. Oh, Lord, would you nourish us, for we are hungry. Would you grow us in grace. We pray this in the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. I'd like to invite the servers to come forward and join me, and the musicians to join me on stage. I'd like to draw your attention again to the graphic that you received, hopefully, when you walked in today that in the trays that the servers will be holding, there is uh, regular bread, that gluten-containing bread, and also uh, juice and wine, white grape juice on the outside, uh, red wine on the inside. On the table as you pass by, you have the option, uh, according to your conscience, uh, you are free to partake however you'd like. You can take a communion package or a, uh, a gluten uh, bread. It's all labeled for you up there. On the night Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, and he said, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In a similar manner, after the meal was over, our Lord took a cup, and knowing full well that he would drink the cup of divine wrath for you and for me, he took a simple, ordinary cup, and he blessed it, and he gave it to his disciples, and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood which is shed for the remission of sins and is shed for many. This table is for those who have put their trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, who have heard the gospel and repented of their sins and who have identified with his body. That is, who have been baptized with water. It doesn't have to be in this church, but in a church that preaches the true gospel of the triune God. If that is you, we invite you to come. I'm going to invite you in a minute to exit your row to the left Come forward, pick up the elements, and to return to your seat, and we will celebrate together. Would you do so confessing your sins, examining your hearts as we are commanded to in Scripture? And would you do so joyfully? For Christ truly was given for you. Would you feast on Christ and grow in the knowledge of that payment for you? But if, however, you have not put your trust in Christ, perhaps, perhaps you've heard the gospel your whole life, but you never believed. Or perhaps you're here for the first time and you've never heard this message of Christ dying for sinners. Whoever you are, I want to thank you so much for being here, but I would ask that you would not partake in this meal because the scripture says it would not do you good and it represents something that you don't believe. But we're so thankful that you are here. Please speak to someone with your questions and please turn to Jesus Christ. He will turn no one away who comes in repentant faith. When you're ready, brothers and sisters, come forward to the table of the Lord Jesus Christ. Chiefest of sinners, Jesus can save. All he has promised, surely he'll do. Wash in the fountain where sinners can bathe. And I'll pass. 
took bread he broke it and he gave it to his disciples and he said this is my body given for you do this in remembrance of me after the meal he took the cup and he blessed it and he gave it to his disciples and he said this cup is the new covenant in my blood which is shed for many for the remission of sins, do this in remembrance of me. Would you please stand?
reach that happy place and be forever blessed. When shall I see my Father? people of God, would you look up and receive his blessing, he who places his name upon you and grants his peace to you for the sake of his son who was given for you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Go in the peace that Jesus Christ has won for you. God bless. Have a wonderful Lord's Day.